I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid, I didn't much enjoy going on moorland walks. I much preferred going to the forest. Moorlands had a habit of being a bit cold and wet and damp, to be honest with you. And of course, there were no sticks to play with. But when I started working on moorlands, or peat bogs, to be more specific, I discovered a hidden beauty, a place where I could be alone and at peace. There was a particularly special time that I experienced when I started working in this environment at dusk, which Emily Pauline Johnson captures perfectly in these verses. A thin, wet sky that yellows at the rim and meets with sun-lost lip the marshes brim. Hushed lie the sedges, and the vapours creep, thick, grey and humid, while the marshes sleep. This painting by Anne Campbell is of a very different time of day, and for me it captures some of the many layers of meaning that peatlands hold for me. She painted this after she'd been for a summer's walk through the peatlands of the Isle of Lewis, where she lives. And once it was dry, she then inscribed in pencil, I don't know if you can read them, uh, the things that she saw as she uh, passed them on her walk. Uh, meadow pipit, beetles, deer, and such like. She also inscribed some of the place names that she passed. Nafirdenen Gai, which means uh, the stream of green, in this case, of green bog mosses. So today, I'm going to ask you to look again at Britain's most overlooked landscape. And I believe that when you do, you too will discover a hidden beauty. You'll discover that all of our lives literally depend on a place that many of us actively avoid ever visiting. So the next time you climb a mountain or go for a walk through a heather moorland, I hope that you will look again at that beautiful view and see some of the different layers of uses, histories and benefits that we all in society derive from that beautiful view. By the end of this talk, you'll also have some ideas about practical things that you and I can actually do in our lives that can help protect this important landscape and habitat so that our children and our children's children can enjoy them. I've been doing this research now for uh, around about a decade or so and during that time I've played a leadership role in research projects worth over 10 million pounds uh, and I've written over 100 publications. I finished my PhD in 2005 uh, and I did my first lecturer and senior lecturer roles at the University of Leeds before then going to the University of Aberdeen, where I became the director of the Aberdeen Centre for Environmental Sustainability, which was a joint initiative between the university and one of the Scottish, Scottish government's research institutes. And now I'm very happy to have ended up here at Birmingham City University with this new position. During this time, in this last decade, half of my work has been in peatlands, mainly in the UK. And half of my work has been in deserts around the world. So this is an embarrassing picture of me in my PhD after having climbed through a number of thorn bushes to do some ecological field work. And I am happy, <coughs> honest. But whether it's in deserts or peatlands, in each of these contexts, I've examined how we and our decision makers have come to know about threats to these places and how we need a new way of thinking if we are to really address these and many other important environmental challenges that the world faces today. I think the thing that surprised me most when I started studying peatlands was just how interconnected we all are with the habitat that most people never actually visit. The water we drink, the air we breathe, we literally depend for our lives on peat bogs. I don't know if you know, but 70% of the drinking water in this country comes from uplands, mainly surface waters, uh, most of which have been derived from peat. 
in Birmingham, for example, uh, much of our water comes from Wales, uh, from peaty hills. And the biggest store of carbon in this country is not in our trees, as many of us think. It's actually locked up under our feet in peat bogs. There's almost as much carbon stored in our peat bogs as there is in all the forests of the UK and France and Germany combined. So, some peat. Here's a bag of peat bogs, uh, peat compost, which didn't travel particularly well, but uh, here we have it. This bag of peat came from a bog that looks something like this. And a bag this size would have taken 100 years to form as carbon dioxide was taken from the atmosphere and incorporated into leaves and stems and roots and then laid down as peat. When you put this on your garden, most of that carbon ends up going back up into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, where it can contribute towards climate change. So a bag this size, over the 100 years that it took to form, uh, has carbon equivalent to driving an average VW Golf with a petrol engine from Birmingham to London, and back twice. Every month, gardeners in the UK consume enough peat to fill not just one Olympic swimming pool, but 69 Olympic swimming pools worth of peat every month. We're now using peat at a rate which is around 200 times faster than it can form naturally. And that's a problem because the habitats from which we are extracting that peat, in the UK principally lowland raised bogs, are now under threat because of our behaviour. There is just 94% of our UK raised bogs left now, which is about 6,000 hectares of that habitat in good condition. And for that reason, the government wants to try and phase out the use of peat by amateur gardeners by 2020. We can help because we can all make a decision the next time we're in a garden centre to look for peat-free compost. And if you want to see some examples uh, afterwards at the back, um, you can come and have a look at some here. But there's a far greater and more insidious threat to our peat bogs. Around 80% of peat bogs in the UK have been damaged in other ways. A significant proportion have been drained, largely in the 1950s and 60s in a failed attempt to improve the productivity of that land for agriculture, principally sheep. The peat dries out and the carbon stored in it begins to return to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. In some places, drainage ditches turn into gullies like this and peat starts washing downhill slopes in great chunks, uh, silting up salmon spawning beds, for example, and reservoirs downstream. And in other places, wildfires have stripped the peat of its vegetation and pollution that has reached the peat in rainwater is now preventing that vegetation from recolonising that bare ground. So we've got a huge problem. Fixing it is hugely important, but it's also enormously expensive because to actually get materials out onto these hill slopes to stabilise them and block up ditches usually requires using helicopters. And there's a huge amount of damaged land that needs to be fixed out there. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, set a target for restoring one million hectares of peat bogs in the UK by 2020. That's equivalent to 1.6 million football pitches, which if you put end to end, would stretch around the world four times. So where are we gonna get the funding to meet this challenge? Funding from government for nature conservation is going down not up. Well, that brings me to my eureka moment, if you want to call it that. I'm not going to oversell this to you because uh, you'll probably say it was pretty obvious, to be honest with you, Mark. Uh, and who knows, maybe a whole load of other people came up with the same idea at the same time. But as far as I know, I was the first person to put two and two together 
and realise that carbon markets have the potential, given the evidence that we now have about the link between peatland restoration and climate change, to pay for that job. The reason for this is that when you restore a peat bog, you immediately stop it from losing carbon. And of course, an active, healthy building peat bog is absorbing and storing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. At the same time, companies are out there who have done everything they can to reduce their emissions at source, but want to go that final step towards becoming carbon neutral. And they're interested in offsetting their emissions to do, to do so, absorbing those final emissions by paying for planting forests or perhaps in future restoring peat bogs. I still vividly remember the moment at which this idea occurred to me. I was a PhD student at the University of Leeds uh, preparing a lecture for a climate change class on climate policy, if I remember right. And I needed to go to the toilet, so uh, I went, wandered up and uh, I got to the toilet and I, I just stood there holding onto the door with a stink you know, coming through and thought, I feel 10 years later the UK government's environment minister uh, launched the pilot UK peatland code. The only difference is that rather than just focusing on carbon offsetting, it enables companies to sponsor peatland restoration for all the benefits that that provides for society. So the journey from the paper I wrote as a PhD student uh, in, with colleagues in 2003 to the peatland code 10 years later in 2013. For me, it was a process that was uh, in equal measure tortuous uh, and fascinating. Now, I tend not to talk too much about this to people because they tend to lose me when I go on about this. But to be honest, for me, the key interest is in this process of studying knowledge exchange. How it is that we as researchers can join together with people out there in the real world to come up with new ideas and new knowledge together and how this knowledge then travels from person to person through social networks and gets into decisions in policy or in practice or not, as the case may be. And why not? I sometimes think that the way that knowledge travels through social networks is a bit like water in a peat bog. Some seeps unseen into the peat itself like knowledge that we gain without even realising sometimes about the world around us. Once it's in the peat, the water often starts to flow through a natural network of pipes that form crisscrossing through the peat profile itself. In a similar way to the way in which we talk to our friends and colleagues and knowledge starts to travel through our social networks and gradually enters the consciousness of those close to us. When the peat is completely soaked, the water starts to travel over the surface, sometimes so fast it takes the peat with it. And for me, this is a bit like the way knowledge sometimes spills over into social media and goes viral, as they say. Once you get an amazing idea out there, it's very hard to stop it. The water moves around rocks as it flows down hill slopes and eventually gets stored for a time in ponds or in reservoirs. And this, in the same way, some people do not like to pass on the knowledge that they have gained for fear of someone else getting a competitive advantage or for fear of what someone might do with it or the amount of extra work it might create for them. Finally, water companies clean brown colour out of our water when it comes from a PT catchment before it reaches our taps, where we then consume it. And in a similar way, some individuals and organisations play this kind of filtering role, selecting, choosing, filtering out the information that we most need uh, and uh, making it clearer to us and perhaps more palatable in the process. Of course, others take that knowledge and they distort it for their own ends, uh, perhaps their own selfish ends. I think that I should probably try and explain exactly what it is that I mean when I talk of knowledge here, because I'm not talking about that mass of information that is out there, for example, uh, on the internet. When I talk of knowledge, I'm talking 
of information that is known by someone. So it involves learning. And of course, who's to say that what you remember from what I've said today will be the same as what the person next to you has perceived that I've said, and what your partner might perceive uh, when you tell them what you've learned today when you get home tonight. The point is that we all make knowledge our own and it changes as it passes from person to person and each person makes it their own. Sometimes it gets twisted into misinformation and myth, but more often than not, what we're doing is we're simply adapting that knowledge so that it, that it is more relevant and useful for us so that we can actually use it in practice. So, this is what happened to the knowledge that my colleagues and I generated in this research about peatlands. Each of the circles in this diagram represents an organisation or type of organisation. I've simplified this in the diagram here. The arrows represent flows of knowledge from individuals in one organisation to individuals in another organisation. And the bigger the arrow, the more people in an organisation are communicating with people in that other organisation. Immediately you can see government in the middle here and everyone's trying to talk to them. And you can see researchers uh, at the back there and you can see that we as researchers are particularly good at communicating with ourselves, whether directly uh, or through these journal articles that we all read and write and only we tend to read and write. But the researchers aren't quite so good at talking to government. However, they're talking equally to NGOs and charities. And it's these NGOs and charities which have picked up on our research findings and are then conveying them to government and others. Seeing how influential these were, I joined forces with them. Principal among these organisations was the IUCN and its UK, UK Peatland programme. And for the last few years, I've been research manager uh, with them, working together with them to get this knowledge to the places where it can really make a difference in government and elsewhere. So this diagram for me, I think, is a bit of a, a microcosm of the research that I've done over the, the last few years. And this new way of thinking that I alluded to earlier on, where researchers, local people and policymakers work together to solve environmental challenges. Recently, I looked at this new way of thinking uh, across 20 different research projects in 11 different countries. And it surprised me how actually the same things seem to work pretty much everywhere. Get the right experts involved. People who know the land like the back of their hand. Policy experts, not just the researchers. Design and carry out your research in collaboration with the people who actually need the answers and treat all knowledge equally, whether it comes from a professor or from a farmer, you know, whoever it is, value it equally, test it equally as well. The point is that none of us knows it all, but by combining these different knowledges and working together, we have a much greater chance of solving some of these enormously intractable and complex problems. So to conclude, a couple of years ago, Scottish Natural Heritage did a survey where they asked people to say, what are the places you would most and least likely visit in Scotland? The place that people said they would be most likely to visit was mountains, second only to oceans. And the second least likely place that people said they would visit in Scotland was peat bogs, second only to derelict land. Despite the fact, if you think about it, that to get to the top of any mountain in Scotland, you have to walk over a peat bog. So I think that very often, like these people, we're so busy looking at the top of the mountain that we're trying to climb, that we miss the beauty of all the things around us on the journey to get there. I know I've been guilty of that. So I'd like to end by playing you a song and asking you to look again at the peat bogs and at the mountains you are climbing.
Oh 